All right. All right. We're going to meet again. Nope. Let's see. All right. Is this? No? Is it? Is it? Yep. Good. All right. Yo, yo, yo. Here we go. Okay. All right. So we are coming back and hope you had a nice break. And what I like to do is just open up the floor to uh, some thoughts, comments. And then as I thought about it, I, I, w I do just want to read a little bit of Ezekiel 28. Uh, I referenced it. I, I read some of Isaiah 14. But I want to give you a little bit of how God describes Lucifer. And, and so I'll, I'll read a little bit of that. But first, uh, thoughts on Nancy? Yes. Like the whole thing, I didn't realize about the free will. So did God give all of his creatures free will? Yes. He had the choice to go back and forth. Where they only had that. And I never heard that before. Yep. They only had that one choice. Exactly. Because we live in time, we have the time to change. And when pure spirits, because they're outside of time and space, it's one decision definitively. But free will is given to all so that any creature, angel, human being, could reciprocate his love. So we had freedom. So we weren't puppets. So... Uh, Dave was actually uh, going to ask a similar question of why would God create a being that he knew was going to rebel yeah. to provide freedom in order that the, the being, the angel, the human person had the capacity to love him back. If we're not free, we can't love. So God allowed the free will. But the angels, it was more definitive. For As human beings, we have, we have time. Right? So thank you. Great, great. Dave, we got your question too. Look at that. Yes. Two for one. <laughs> yes, Mel? I think you just answered this, but I'm a little hard-headed. Um, Me angels, too. You're in good company. It's like, it's, it's, <laughs> with the angels, I mean, let's say like, and again, you know, we relate to like, say if that was me doing, make a decision and say, I've got to do this, right? And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't right. So once yes. they did that, they're... they're That's meant, it. Right? Yep, because they would have seen it as pure spirits. They would have seen exactly what they were... You know, so to be fair to us, we don't see the full consequences, you know, and then uh, secondly is well, we have time. They see everything. God revealed all things should say the majority of all things. They knew the basic plan. We know they didn't disclose some details. And there's actually a beautiful part of our spiritual tradition in the desert when the devil says, if you are the son of God. He's not sure, right? He's trying to figure it out. So the details were not given to the uh, angels, but they received sufficient summary of the plan of salvation to make a decision. And they would have seen it and they would have known yay or nay. So... Um, they certainly would have known there were consequences. They thought the consequences would, were that they were going to dethrone God and then Lucifer himself would be God. So, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sure, this, I'm sure we have something. I'm sure we have an opinion of that. It's just, I don't know it. <laughs> so, yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. Good point. Oh, in the back. In the back. I'll come back to your friend. Go ahead. Yep, yep. Yeah, the demons, right, right. The demons are fallen angels, and like a fire is just a figurative way of describing hell. Oh, okay. yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Although hell did not become the term for the place of damnation until about the fourth century, hell used to be a broad term, just meant like a holding tank. So, for example, all the righteous souls of the old covenant were held were held in hell, which now we would use a different term. You know, so that's actually. That's actually the basis of the term limbo. So we used to, in theology, we call it the limbo patrorum, the holding cell of the fathers. That's where God held the righteous of the old covenant until the coming of the Christ. That was also called hell. That's why the Apostles' Creed refers to hell. In the fourth century on, theology, just with the development of language, hell became synonymous with the place of damnation. That was not its original context. There was a place of damnation. It had other uh, terms. So, um, Okay, Fran. Yeah. This is deep stuff. <laughs> and by the way, this whole field is called angelology. And there are actually priests who are trained and skilled just in angels. So 
There's, a, there's an answer to your question, Nancy, I'm sure, somewhere. So. What I want to know is, are you saying that the, the angels, when they had their freedom to choose, they had more of an idea where we right. have consequences. When mm-hmm. we make a choice, we don't have that foresight that, sure. that, yep. that God gave the angels to see. Yes, okay. yes, and, and more capacity to love. So oh, their, okay. their betrayal was actually more severe than ours because they saw more and they could love more and they choose to, to not obey. So, and as pure spirits, their decision was definitive. So, and if there's a part that says, I'm still not sure if I get that, we are stuck in our human nature. We can attempt to cognitively grasp as best we can what that might look like but we can't fully understand it because we live in time and space. So the time and space are creatures. So we live within them. Angels do not. So it's pure spirits. So, yes, Eileen. I've been confused about when we get to heaven, we're going to be perfectly happy, right? Amen. Get to heaven, we're happy. So I think it was in 33 days to mm-hmm. glory. That's correct. Okay, this is great. It's funny. I was just writing about this last night. So, our, so yes, God is infinitely perfect, blessed in himself. Our souls have an amazing capacity to be expanded. And that expansion happens by grace. So the more grace we receive, the more our souls are enhanced in order that we can receive more love from God and reciprocate more love to him. The more we do that in this life, then the different levels we will be in heaven. So whether we're a little Dixie cup, we're going to be completely full and happy. Ooh, happy little Dixie cup, right? Or whether we are a huge gallon, right, and completely full, we're going to be happy. So no matter where we are, we'll be completely happy, but there are levels. This is why the little flower says, there's so many big flowers I just want to be a little flower. You know, she wanted to be a little Dixie cup. Of course, God made her this huge you know, container of grace. right? So there are different levels. No matter where we are, we, we will be happy, but there are different levels. That parallel, according to our mystical tradition, parallel the angelic choirs. So, and if you really want to go with this, Eileen, this is our spiritual theology. This is not doctrine. Then the spiritual tradition, when... How many is a third of all the angels? We have no idea. Right? But the spiritual tradition says that when the number of the elect within humanity fills the space that was left by the third of the angels, the Christ will come, and time and space will end. So if you're thinking, when is this all going to wrap up? When, as Paul tells us, all will be all. The whole left by the fallen angels are filled by the elect human beings. So that's a, that's a theological opinion, but that's not doctrine. But it's interesting, isn't it? So, All right, let's go to Ezekiel. Let's, let me just give you this. So Ezekiel 28, again, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, gives us a little bit of glimpse of, of the evil one. This is what God says about Lucifer. Because your heart is proud and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of the gods and in the heart of the seas. Yet you are but a man and no God, though you consider yourself as wise as a God. You are indeed wiser than Daniel, no secret is hidden from you. By your wisdom and your understanding, you have gotten wealth for yourself and have gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your wealth, and your heart has become proud in your wealth. Therefore, thus says the God, the Lord God, because you consider yourself as wise as a God, therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall thrust you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of, a, of the slain in the heart of the seas. If we go further to verse, if you're following me, if you go to verse 11, <coughs> towards the end, you were the signet of perfection full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was, for, was your covering, cornelian, topaz, and jasper, chrysolite, beryl, and onyx, sapphire, carbuncle and emerald, and wrought in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. 
with an anointed guardian cherub, I placed you, and you were on the holy, holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence, and you sinned. As I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and the guardian cherub drove you out in the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings in feet to feast their eyes on you. By the multitude of your iniquities, in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. I brought forth fire in the midst of you. It consumed you as I turned to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who, knew, all who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. And it goes on. So again, it's figurative language by use of the prophets. He's using imagery that he would have known in terms of his cultural context. But you get the sense of God's complete dismissal of the arrogance and the pride and God reminding Lucifer how much he was blessed, his beauty, his uh, wisdom, uh, the blessings that God bestowed upon him. All these are images, figurative language in order to show all that God had given, and yet he stays this rebellion against him. So that's uh, Ezekiel 28. Let's pick up then with, so the creation begins, the angels are created, Lucifer leads the revolt, God raises up Michael, they're cast into hell. We know that the fallen one was jealous, he was powerful, he's cunning, beautiful, and wise. And then God created human beings as the crown of his creation. He created the whole earth, the system of days given to us in the early parts of Genesis to describe the hierarchy, the structure, the harmony of creation. It was not meant to be understood literally. How can you have a day when the sun and the moon aren't created till the fourth day? Huh? So it's figurative in order to describe that there's a beauty, a symmetry to creation. And then God created all things. Remember, he had the angels to help him to control the created world. And then he crowned his creation with the human person. And he allowed us to have material, to have a body, so we could look at the world around us and say, this is me. He allowed us to have a soul so we could look to God and the angelic choirs and say, this is me. So we were united to both. And he crowned that, his creation with the human person. We are the only beings that are, we are told that were made in his likeness and image. So the angels were not, nor, nor was the lower creation. That was a, a gift given to the human family. So God created us. He made us in his image and likeness. It's so Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. He gave us authority over creation. When Adam was told to name the animals, he knew them. And he wasn't just making up names, right? Dog, camel, duck, bill, platypus. Remember, I got stuck on that one. <laughs> Should have said honey badger. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Man, that's a honey badger. Don't mess with that guy, you know? <laughs> so Adam had authority. Our first parents had authority over creation. It was known to them. And they were called, the human family were called to be a part of God's family. Again, Lucifer seeing that humanity would be extended, would be raised by grace to be a part of God's own family, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The angels were not given, would not be given uh, that honor. So that's our first inheritance. So we are created. We are the crown of creation. We're made in his image and likeness. What does that also mean? And so God had our natural nature, right? So our basic human nature. And then he said, Phew, if they're going to do this right, I'm going to have to give them some special gifts. So he gave us what are called the praetor natural gifts, right? So, you know, supernatural means above nature. Praetor natural means beyond nature. Praetor means beyond. So the preternatural gifts. Why preternatural, not supernatural? Well, because the preternatural gifts were held by the angels. So it wasn't completely above nature, above creation, like supernatural things, right? like the life of God. It's completely above all creation. Right? But the preternatural gifts, these are held by angels. So it's not actually above nature. It's just beyond our nature. But some other nature has it, the angels. Make sense? So... So whenever someone talks about being their house is possessed, they're like, it's a supernatural phenomena. If they're good theologians, they would know it's actually a preternatural phenomena, right? So we're given these preternatural gifts, and what are those? So first, our bodies and souls shared immortality. 
both. So we were of the earth, we have a material body, but we would never get sick, we would never have disease, and we were never supposed to die. So we would live out our natural lives and then be assumed, body and soul, into paradise. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. We see, of course, that being played out in the life of Our Lady who had no sin. That's why we celebrate her assumption. By the way, if you're wondering, how long? How long will we have lived? Do you know what tradition tells us about Our Lady's age? You know this? 72. So Our Lady lived to be 72. At the end of her 72nd um, birthday, uh, during her second, after her 72nd birthday, uh, she was assumed body and soul to paradise. What does that say? I have no idea. What does that mean? I don't know. But just interesting, right? That's not doctrinal teaching. That's just our tradition. So 72. But body and soul, we were not supposed to die. Our reason and our passions worked together. There was harmony. So if I said, I need to be nice to my na- kind to my neighbor, I would be kind, right? Wouldn't that be great? We would actually have to work to sin. <laughs> Incidentally, this is why, if you look at the Genesis account of the first temptation, when the devil appears, he begins to speak to Eve by her reason. Did God tell you that you could not eat of any of the trees? And she begins to dialogue with him. Bad move, Mother Eve. God didn't say that. God said we could eat of all the trees, just not that tree, because we would die. Oh, but you won't die if you eat from that tree. He has to tempt her by her reason. Her passions would completely obey her reason. Right? So it wasn't like the, uh, the devil was like, hey, Eve, ooh, look at this pear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yummy. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you know, our tradition... The long-standing part of our tradition says it was a pear. I don't know when it changed. Probably like the apple industry moved it to. I guess it wouldn't be the apple industry, right? You know? but somewhere the pear, the pear, exactly. Yeah. The, the, it was the pear industry that you know, was really an apple, right? All the scriptures tell us is fruit, and of course it's figurative language, right? But you can imagine that the devil could not use something to entice the passion of Eve because it obeyed her reason. She had to work. Our first parents had to work to sin. So just like we have to work for virtue, that's how they had to work to sin. Wouldn't that be nice? But we just were naturally virtuous? That would be great. Okay, so that was one of the uh, preternatural gifts. And then the last one, which I begin to appreciate more and more with age, but uh, infused knowledge. Wouldn't that be nice? You're like, wow, you know, I'd really like to go bowling or something. You've never bowled in your life. Boom, that's it. You got everything, all you need, right? Or, gosh, I really, I never really picked, I was never really a gardener. I really like to enjoy gardening. And boom, everything you need to know. Wouldn't that be great? It was just given to you, especially divine truth. Our first parents knew God, knew him, like he was infused into them, right? And, of course, the knowledge that was necessary for them to fulfill their vocation, to care for the garden to have children, to be parents, all of that was infused, right? I bet you some of our young parents wish they had that. Maybe some of our older parents, when you were in, that, uh, in the throes, you're probably like, wouldn't that be great to just have infused knowledge? You know, like when to do what, you know? So those three gifts are called the preternatural gifts. And as powerful as they were, they were subordinate, they were less than sanctifying grace. This is the part we really want to make sure we understand this. So we had three preternatural gifts. That's called original justice. But then we had sanctifying grace, the life of God within us. And the preternatural gifts and sanctifying grace are called original justice. And the scriptures describe it. Genesis says God came to them in the breeze of the evening. He wanted to go for a walk with them. So it describes figuratively the relationship that sanctifying grace gave to us. We knew God. We were a part of his family. We were his children. He came to be with us, to take a walk in the evening with us. So we had that intimacy, that closeness with God. All right. These are remarkable gifts. What a different reality God wanted for us. huh? You think about it. That's the life and the world God wanted for us. 
So we look at the world today, it's like this is not the world that God wanted. And we look at the world that we have chosen, we have created by sin, and we blame God for it. Meanwhile, God's like, that's never the world I wanted for you. I never wanted you to die and to know what it means to lose someone. I never wanted you to have to go through this suffering. I never wanted you to have to learn stuff and not know what you need in order to take care of yourself or your loved ones. I never wanted any of that. We chose that. St. Paul is saying very clearly in his letter to the Romans, the wages of sin is death and all that comes with that. So the body with the fall, we, the body suffers the mortality of the world around it. We lost infused knowledge. We lost sanctifying grace. And our passions wage war against our reason. We can know that something is wrong and purposely, intentionally choose to do it. We can know that something is right and purposely, intentionally choose not to do it. Right? So we see a fallenness that has come. So let's go to Genesis 3 to the fall from grace. So we see that in Genesis 3, and the Catechism tells us that this is figurative language. Now, as I say it's figurative language, let me clarify that Mother Church clearly teaches that Adam and Eve were historical people. So Adam and Eve were real. The account is described in figurative language. Why? Well, first, because language just failed. You know when there's something that's so majestic or so terrible and you just can't describe? You ever see something, witness something, it's either so beautiful or so just ugly and outrageous and shocking, you can't even talk about it? It's just, you know, it's like, what, you know, same. Why, this is where figurative language comes in. We use figurative language because cognitive thought, rational thought cannot, literal thought cannot express what happened. Right? So I don't want us to say, oh, figurative language and dismiss it. No, actually, I think figurative language shows us even more importantly and, and essentially the, in, the, the, the urgency of this message, like the depth that's there, and also shows us the work that we have to do because we have to get in there now and navigate this and try to understand what's being said, what's happening. Okay, so understanding the figurative language, uh, let's go to Genesis 3. What happens? The serpent. So, um, of course... Uh, he is referred to uh, by many names I mentioned. So his proper name, of course, is Lucifer. Uh, he's called uh, the devil, and he's also called uh, Satan. Satan means accuser. The devil means divider. So whenever we refer to the devil or to Satan, we're actually using a title, which is appropriate because in our tradition, we historically never spoke his name. So you know some of these kids' novels and books where they have the evil figure and no one ever says his name? That's actually in our tradition, so, we historically would not say the devil's name. We referred to him by his evil actions. He accuses us before God, seeking our damnation. He divides us in order to make us easy prey. He is the devil. He is Satan. And the scriptures re refer to him as serpent. Okay, so he's cunning. We're told in verse 20, so chapter 3, verse 20, he is cunning, the most cunning of all the animals, so of all creatures. So, and we were told that, we were told that by the prophets uh, about his ability to manipulate. And he talks to Eve. Now, he, I'm sorry, uh, the reference to the devil being cunning is earlier in chapter 3. I'm sorry. In verse 20, we are told Eve is named by Adam. Uh, so Adam names his wife, the first woman, Eve. And we're told in verse 20, that she's called Eve because she is the mother of all the living. Now that little piece of information is very important because it's going to help us to unlock another part of the scriptures. So the devil, the serpent, he comes. He's the most cunning. He's talking to Eve. Why doesn't he go to Adam? Right? Why doesn't he go to Adam? Right? So first, Adam is the holder of the covenant. Right? Also, why did Eve not bring Adam into the conversation? Now get this. In the Hebrew, the plural is being used, which means Adam is standing right next to her. That kind of changes it, doesn't it? <laughs> right? He is standing right next to her. And then later in the sacred narrative, she, we are told, and she gave a piece of the fruit to her husband who was there with her. Right? So he's right there. But the devil goes to Eve. He is trying to circumvent the holder of the covenant. 
He is trying to separate the spouses so that Eve will not seek the help of her husband or husband the help of his wife. So he goes to Eve and he begins to speak. Remember, he's cunning. He begins to create what we call an occasion of sin. He wants Eve to dialogue with him. Because once you start dialoguing with darkness, even then before the fall, you become easier prey. After the fall, we definitely become easy prey, which is why we do not dialogue with darkness. But the devil comes, he's the most cunning, he goes to Eve. Also, Eve, not only does she become easier prey because she's not seeking the support of her husband, spouses supporting one another, but also Eve has a vocation that the devil wants. She is the mother of all the living. So if he gets mother, he's got humanity. So in our world, when people attack motherhood, they are continuing the work of the evil one. Because if you get motherhood, you've got civilization, you've got humanity. So the devil is very tricky, very cunning. In the exchange in Hebrew, this is very beautiful. We can rally the uh, the troops of praise for uh, Mother Eve. In the original exchange, Eve begins by using the personal name of God, Yahweh. So the devil comes. He starts to speak to her. Did the devil say you could not eat of any of the trees? He's using a hyperbole. He's trying to provoke conversation. He knows he's lying. Remember later Jesus in John chapter 8 will say, he came to us as a liar and a murderer, right? He comes, he knows he's lying. Did God say you could not eat of any of the trees? And Eve comes back and says, no, we can eat of all the trees except that one. Ah, she's the one pointing out the tree. He knows. He's very cunning. Oh, why, do, why can't you eat from that tree? Well, if we eat of that tree, then we will die. Oh, you will not die. God knows that you will be his equal. You will be like God if you eat of that tree. And then we are told the fruit looked enticing to her. The passions obey reason, right? And reason betraying truth. So this exchange, but Eve begins by speaking of God as Yahweh. And then you can probably guess what happens. In the course of the exchange, the language changes. Eve stops saying Yahweh, the personal name of God, I am. She changes to Adonai, the generic God. The equivalent would be using Jesus as opposed to God. So when we speak about the Lord Jesus, it's personal. It provokes our heart. God, still reference to the divine, but it's generic. Right? It kind of takes some teeth away. Right? So she shifts to Adonai in the course of the conversation, showing us that she's starting to slip. The personal God, her father, is now God distant. You see the move? Okay. Adam, again, we are told in the Hebrew, is with her. The narrative tells us he's with her, and the narrative uses the plural. So he's right there. He's right there. And we know that they, of course, succumb, first of reason, then they eat the piece of the fruit, using this figurative language. And this is the betrayal of God the Father by his children, Complete act of disobedience, total rebellion, betrayal, complete and total deception. Right? So they fall. As has been described by our spiritual masters, it would be as if our human nature was a beautiful palace or a beautiful temple, and someone brought in a grenade and handed the grenade to our first parents. And they said, oh, this is nice. And as they were walking away, they said, Go and pull that pin. <laughs> you know? And they pulled the pin, and the blast devastated the palace. Not taking down the walls. It's not completely lost. Our human nature is still there. It's created by God. It's good. But those walls just held the blast. And the beauty of the palace is now utter chaos. Everything is in discord. Nothing is the way it's supposed to be. The preternatural gifts are gone. 
sanctifying grace has been lost, we are left now to our own devices. Such a great loss, especially sanctifying grace. For our first parents to realize that God dwelt within them. They were his children, and they lost it all. The loss would have been overwhelming. We can imagine that they would have quickly followed a beeline to despair and desolation. What's the point of our existence? We have lost everything. God is unknown to us. We don't know what to do. We've lost infused knowledge. We now have this battle within us, right? We don't understand. And why am I starting to have this cough, right? And suddenly you begin to realize it's all been taken away. God allowing a discipline to befall his children, to allow them to suffer the consequences of their decision, the consequences of the fall. But in the midst of all this, you can imagine just all that possible despair and desolation. In the midst of that, God, in the midst of God allowing this discipline, God gives a singular promise to his children. A singular promise to Adam and Eve and to their descendants. And that is the only cause for our hope. The one promise that a Savior will come who will fix it. Didn't know when, didn't know how, but a Savior would come. So if you have your scriptures, you can turn with me. I'll read it if you don't have a Bible. But if you turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, let's look at this promise. Our tradition calls this the proto-evangelium. So again, proto just means first. Like you think of like a prototype. So first, proto-evangelium, that's just a word for gospel or good news. So the first gospel, the first good news. You can imagine as they lost the preternatural gifts, they lost sanctifying grace, this was the first piece of good news they had, right? That a Savior would come. A Savior would be sent to them. So let me read Genesis 3.15, and then we want to parse it, because as you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, rich, richness of meaning in, in this passage. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. She will strike at your head and you will strike, excuse me, he will strike at your head and you will strike at his heel. Okay, so again, that one simple verse, right, it's probably one of the most important pieces of scripture in the whole of salvation history. So later as we talk about the passing of the promise, the passing of the inheritance from, Adam, from Abraham to Isaac and so on and so on, all this, this is what they're passing, is this promise. It's going to continue to remain within the family of God, the people of God, this promise that a Savior is going to come. But let's look at the wording of this. Let's look at what was said. So first we're told that there's going to be enmity between the serpent and the offspring of the woman. We know by the Hebrew it's a male child, a male, a son. So there's going to be enmity. What does that mean? Hatred, strife, battle. There's a spiritual battle that's going to happen. right? And we know that it's going to be between um, the serpent and this male offspring of the woman. And the woman here, ironically, is not called Eve. So he is literally, God is literally speaking to Eve and Adam, but he does not use her name. He simply refers to the woman, right? The woman, meaning it's not Eve. So it's going to be a descendant of the woman. Right? So who is this woman? Quick sidebar, this is why Jesus calls his mother woman. And John's gospel stresses woman. John does not use Our Lady's proper name. And as our Lord is dying on the cross, woman, behold your son. John wants us to make this connection to this woman of, John, of Genesis 3. So it's between the serpent's offspring. So here when we speak of 
offspring, we can just well use the term minions that we've referred to, and the woman, her offspring. And what's going to happen? The evil one is going to strike at the heel, but the son of the woman is going to strike at the head. So obviously crushing and destroying it, right? So what does that immediately tell us in the Proto-Evangelium is that there's going to be a savior who's going to crush the head of the evil one, but the evil one's going to do some damage, right? Because he's going to strike at the heel, right? You know, in Greek mythology, it helps us in terms of the ancient world, Achilles' heel. The heel was deadly to a warrior. If you harmed his heel, he could not fight. So we are told that the Savior is going to be striked, is going to be struck at his heel. So the Savior, when he comes, will be wounded. Right? He'll be a wounded victor, a wounded Savior. Right? He's not going to be this triumphant, glorious uh, conqueror. He's going to do the will of God, but there are going to be dire consequences to him for this. What do you think of that? Can you understand when Jesus is walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus and he says, you fools, did you not know that the Messiah must suffer? It's literally there at the beginning. And then you talk about all the prophets. They speak about constantly the Messiah has to suffer, right? But here we see that the, 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 the evil one is going to do uh, his damage. All right, what else do we see in this passage? Salvation will come from a man and a woman. So the fall comes from a man and a woman. Damnation, the fall. Salvation is going to come from a man and a woman. Now this is the interesting part. The man and the woman who brought damnation is husband and wife. But when it comes time for salvation, God changes the relationship of the man and woman. And it becomes mother and son. Not husband and wife. Why would... Why that change? Because the battle is for life, human and divine. The battle ultimately is to regain motherhood. Because when Eve fell, motherhood fell with her. So God changes the means of salvation to include motherhood. So that the woman who gives birth to her son, then the son will be Messiah, will be Savior. But he will come through a woman through motherhood. Now that's powerful because the serpent will get his violence. The promised savior will be wounded. He will be struck at his heel, but he will be victorious. He will crush the head and the victory of the savior will come within the arena of motherhood. Now, that's powerful. Just that portion of this part of Genesis, I hope is just radically changing everything that you are thinking in terms of Mary. That from the very beginning, from the promise of salvation, it will come from a daughter of Eve, the woman whose son will crush the head of the serpent. Which means, if we had a Messiah, and the mother was not a part of his sacrifice, the prophecy would not be fulfilled. The promise would still be unfulfilled. This is why in the scriptures we are told, Mary's there, we see her, we see her, we see how she forms him and molds him. She disappears during his public ministry relatively, then she comes back, and we are definitely told she's there at the cross while the sacrifice is being offered. And then we see her there at Pentecost receiving the Holy Spirit with the apostles. Why is she up there? What, she sneak in? <laughs> we know that she did not receive the Holy Spirit for priesthood. Nowhere in our tradition did she ever attempt to preach the gospel or preside at the Eucharist. Nowhere. The one human being who could have claimed the right, the right to a priesthood does not. And instead she receives the Holy Spirit to fulfill her vocation as the woman, the mother of the church. So she continues to do the work of the Savior to be his cooperator, his advocate. In our mystical tradition we call her the co-redemptrix. There's only one Redeemer. That's Jesus Christ. And Mary's the first one to tell us that. Co-redemptrix is one saying that she's with him. Redemptrix means subordinate. It's, it's the feminine, but also means the subordinate in this context. Co-redemptrix, she's there. There at the Calvary, Our Lady is there. 
In the upper room, the spirit is falling. In order to give birth to the church, Our Lady is there. She's co redemptrix She's united with the work of her son. The woman must be united with the son in order for the promise and the prophecy to be fulfilled. Do you see why this is so important? And when we get challenged on this, we have to be very careful because sometimes people are challenging it. They don't understand the scriptures and they might actually be, without even intending to it, to do it, to actually take the, the feet out from our Lord's claim to be Messiah. To say Jesus of Nazareth is not Messiah for he did not fulfill the prophecy. To say his mother is not significant or the woman does not have to be a part of the sacrifice. So you see here the promise that God is giving. He's molding and fashioning and shaping the whole of creation and the whole of salvation history in order to have this promise fulfilled. I think it's also important that as the victory of the Savior is brought about through his mother, he will be her offspring, her son. She is united with him. Not simply in the offering, but in the continual offering of his redemption to humanity. So this is definitely where we have to start to understand the plan of salvation. And we have to grasp, seek to grasp, the basic roots of what it means to have Mary as a part of our discipleship. Because she literally had to be a part of the work of redemption by the plan of God and by the fulfillment of prophecy for us to say, she's not supposed to be a part of my discipleship or she gets in the way is to show a real lack of biblical understanding and what it means ultimately to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now one thing I want to mention, I thought I had it in my notes, but in Revelation 12, John goes back to Genesis. Now, I mentioned this once in a homily, but most Jewish theology begins at, uh, um, at Abraham, Genesis 12. Very rarely does the Judaic tradition go to the early world. It's kind of shocking. It's like, okay, yeah, that's part of our tradition, but everybody wants to talk about Abraham, and we just move on, right? So it's interesting whenever there's a reference to the Old Testament. Jesus was quoting from the, the early world all the time. It was not unique. It would have struck the original listeners as odd. Like, why does he keep doing that, right? But in John's... Uh, record, the book of Revelation, you know, he's taken up to heaven, he sees all these visions and so on, he comes down, he's trying to write them down. He's using a lot of figurative language because he can't explain what he's just seen. He's actually just seen the presence of God. And he can't fully explain it, so he's using intense, apocalyptic, figurative language to try to express it. And Genesis, in, in Revelation 12, he goes back to Genesis and he tells us some important things about the serpent. Now, once we hear serpent, and we are helped with this by our children's Bibles, for good or for ill. We think serpent, what do we think of? A little snake, right? You see a little snake wrapped around the tree, you know. Actually, serpent here, John tells us in Revelation 12, serpent was more akin to a dragon. So it wasn't this cute little, you know, snake that comes in he comes, and you can imagine, suddenly when he's speaking to Eve, we're talking about a mass, and, and a dragon, again, it's figurative language. It means it was a hideous being, a creature that provoked fear and, over, and was just overwhelming. Right? Something, when that serpent came, there was some fear or shock by its presence, like a dragon, you can imagine. right? So you see how figurative language is important. Something was there that just very much shocked them. And so when he's asking Eve these questions, it's possible... And John tells us in Revelation 12, in, in the Judaic tradition, Adam didn't say a word because he was afraid. He feared death. So even though they knew that they could not die, and the only way, reason why they eventually died was because of their fall, Adam allowed fear to lie to him and said, I'm not going to challenge this dragon, this serpent, because he's going to kill me. So he allowed his wife, his partner, to be tempted and led into the fall because of his cowardice. And you see that contained in Revelation 12, which means one could actually argue, what was the original fall? Was it the pride or was it the cowardice that led to the pride? Or are they both contained in this simultaneous action that as Our Lady, as Eve fell through pride, Adam concurrently fell through cowardice. 
And as man and woman become the means of damnation, so a man and a woman, now changed to a mother and son, because motherhood must be regained, now is be a man and a woman, but mother and son, who brings salvation. And just to really show you the harmony of God, our damnation was brought about when an angel, Lucifer, looking like some dragon, monstrous serpent, when an angel, Lucifer, spoke to a virgin, Eve, about a piece of fruit. That was our damnation. And in a harmonious way, and seeing both the humor of God and his perfection, our salvation is brought about when an angel, Gabriel, speaks to Mary, a virgin, about a piece of fruit, the womb, the child in her womb. And we have the beginning of our salvation. So you see this beautiful complementarity, huh? It's like Archbishop Sheen said, if you had a master for, masterful conductor and he's leading the orchestra and someone makes a mistake, he has options. He can stop the whole thing and just walk out, as some artists are inclined to do. Huh? Or he can pretend it didn't happen and allow the work to be compromised and keep going. But if he's really talented, he could use the mistake in such a way on the spot to change the entire piece of music where what was once a mistake now instead becomes the first note of an entire new piece of the overall work. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ, God the Father, is doing through Jesus Christ. And through the woman, his mother. So far, so good. I think we're going to need a 10-minute break. I'll see you in about 10 minutes. Awesome.